This is number 14 in the study, and finally we're here in the book itself. Uh, but we will have just a brief bit of review regarding the uh, overhead uh, slide in relation to time. The overhead slide was meant to uh, project the whole of the dispensation of law. Now remember, because the dispensation of grace is a mystery, the people who lived before the mystery didn't know it was going to occur. They saw human history as, uh, as it um, unfolds to the end of the tribulation period. Now the reason that we know that is because from Moses on, there were various prophecies. Even the prophecy, as we read in Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28 through 30, of uh, them being scattered to the uh, four corners of the earth and finally being regathered to the land, the great diaspora or the fifth cycle of discipline. We saw and have studied with regard to the latter reign and the former reign. And by the way, those are not out of order. That's the way they actually are in relation to Israel's uh, year. Their former reign starts in, uh, in and around October. Their latter reign starts uh, in the spring. And then as uh, time began to unfold, other people began writing prophecies toward the end time. Now, one of these, uh, or two of them that are really pertinent are found in the book of Daniel. Jesus actually names the, the time that is given us there, and he calls it the times of the Gentiles. Now, please remember that the fullness of the Gentiles, as it is in Romans 11, has to do with the rapture and the completion of the body of Christ. It has nothing to do with the times of the Gentiles. The uh, qualification of the definition of this is that Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So the times of the Gentiles are when Israel is predominantly ruled or influenced by Gentile nations. Now, of course, uh, in the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, what nation actually was ruling over the land of Israel? It was Rome. Uh, and then you can go back. Uh, Greece uh, ruled there, and then uh, uh, Persia, and then uh, then um, uh, Babylon. But the times of the Gentiles has to do with actually two visions, one of Nebuchadnezzar especially, and then one of Daniel. But the one of Nebuchadnezzar goes from the head to the toes uh, in a declining value of metal till you get to clay, but uh, in increasing uh, strength from gold then to the iron until you get to the clay. And so Jesus Christ lived in the times of the Gentiles. And even today, were it not for certain Gentile nations, just like the United States of America, Israel would collapse probably overnight uh, with the, um, the sheer volume of, of military resources all around it. Egypt from the south, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Iran, uh, um, Syria, and so forth, they, they wouldn't stand a chance were it not for the technology and armaments and the money of nations like us. We are um, pro-Semitic. Of course, that gets us in trouble, and uh, especially since there seems to be some anti-Semitic forces on the horizon. But uh, the times of the Gentiles continues on. Then we noted another one. It's called Daniel 70 weeks. And Daniel 70 weeks have to do actually with 70 times 7, and that equals 490 years. And uh, when you uh, look into the Hebrew itself, that is exactly what it's talking about, why they translated it weeks, it just except Shabuah means sevens. And so they just translated, well, what do I say here? They should have said sevens or 70 times seven, but instead they said weeks. But that's okay. We can define it and understand it. Now, that was to go on consecutively except for one thing. 69 of the weeks were to be fulfilled uh, from the time of a decree to rebuild Jerusalem until the time that Christ presented himself. And those uh, 483 years or 69 weeks were literally fulfilled. That's why we know that there is going to be a literal tribulation period. Literally, these um, 
years, 483 years, were fulfilled from the decree until Christ presented himself. And Jesus wept over this one fact. He said, you didn't know the time of your visitation. They should have. Had they calculated that, they would have known exactly that he was their Messiah. But uh, though they uh, said that they were students of the scripture, they they didn't uh, do very well. So we know, therefore, that once uh, this is calculated in history, Messiah is going to come and it says that he's going to be cut off and then the people of the prince that should come would um, destroy the temple and the sanctuary, then the great diaspora, then the regathering, and then finally the last week. Now we said all that to say this. The book of Revelation is primarily about this last week or period of seven years uh, that is concluding the dispensation of law. It has the years after the rapture to the signing of the um, covenant with Antichrist and Israel to seven years later when he finally comes back and uh, begins the process of establishing his kingdom. So Revelation is primarily about that. So we're going to start here, and we're going to go with verse number one. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, this is Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. Please keep in mind that the Apostle Paul saw Jesus Christ in a revelation according to mystery. And uh, prior to the writing of, of John in 34 AD, Paul saw Christ. And then in subsequent visions, Jesus Christ gave him the message, the gospel, the instructions for this dispensation. So we look back to the Apostle Paul, and he had this vision according to mystery. Now, it's no longer a mystery. After, when Christ came back and revealed these things, Paul is telling us what the program is today. Now, that, that mystery program, or the dispensation of grace, fits between the scattering and uh, the gathering of the nation of Israel. So we actually are living in a time when prophecy is being fulfilled, though Israel, per se, is stagnant, temporarily set aside, uh, not being dealt with by God, except for the fact that they are being ethnically preserved. Now that's important. Uh, when we've had major wars, for example, World War II, what was one of the objectives of Adolf Hitler? Annihilate the Jew. Uh, that's why six million of them were, were killed. Um, so if you could just annihilate the Jew, then, then uh, Antichrist has won or the program of Satan has won. But uh, God preserves them. Now, shortly after, I say shortly, it was several years after, uh, Paul died in 67 AD, there was another apostle. His name was John. He was a kingdom apostle. He was not the one grace apostle, Paul. And he saw another revelation of Jesus Christ, but this time it's in accordance with prophecy. And the book that he wrote takes us beyond the church age, and to the time prior to the tribulation, through the tribulation, to the end. Oh, and ultimately, Revelation chapter 19 and the first part of chapter 20 tell us about Jesus Christ's return and the establishment of his kingdom. So that's what this book is about. So when he talks about the revelation of Jesus Christ, he's talking about a vision he saw according to God's prophetic program. Now note, which God gave unto him, that is a reference back to Christ. What's the importance here in contrast? God sat Christ at his right hand, gave him to be head of the church, and sent him back down for the revelation of Christ according to mystery. God the Father gave it to Christ. Christ gave it to Paul. Now, in this case, subsequently, God wants information for these people in this time period. And so, therefore, God the Father said to Jesus Christ, go back down, and I want you to show yourself uh, to John so that those books will be available. Now, why do they need to be available now? Why didn't he wait until just after the rapture? Well, the principle is, all Scripture is for our learning. It doesn't matter if it's Old Testament, uh, Paul's writings, or the future writings. 
And the doctrine of adumbration says that there is going to be some setting of the stage prior to the rapture so that we can look at the book of Revelation and see actually uh, where we are in history, how things are progressing. And that, that's why we can study this book and it has value for us. Not that we'll be in the tribulation, but that we'll see the stage being set and it will give us good motivation for soul winning and for our own Christian way of life. Okay. To show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Now, uh, is this a reference to things that are going to shortly come to pass from the time John saw the vision or things that must shortly come to pass after the rapture and the resuming of the kingdom program? That's what it is. Uh, things that are shortly come to pass because when Jesus and John the Baptist started their ministry, what did they say? They started it about three or four years prior to the close of this time and knowing then on the prophetic horizon that, that, um, there, there were things going to happen and one, one period of seven years left. What did they say? The kingdom of heaven is where? At hand. It's, cl it's close at hand. When you see these things, know it's at the door. Uh, and that this generation is not going to pass away till all these things be fulfilled. And that's what this is a reference to. Not things that are going to shortly come to pass after John saw the vision, but things that are going to shortly come to pass once the kingdom program is resumed. He sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Now verse number two. John is going to bear record of the Word of God. Now, one of the ways that he does that, of course, is that he was one who lived in the lifetime of Jesus Christ. In fact, uh, he uh, by far outlived the Lord because the Lord was crucified in 33 AD and he ascended there. And John lived on to, to die around 96, 97 AD. Uh, he indeed was John the Aged. Uh, but it, it just seemed that no one could uh, kill him to, at that time. Domitian, the emperor, tried. If he didn't recant, he threw him in a pot of boiling oil, and somehow he, he, um, he got out of that. And so Domitian said, okay, I can't kill you, but I can exile you. And that's how he ended up on the Isle of Patmos. <laughs> so uh, yeah, he, he went there, and he saw a bare record of the Word of God. Now, if you'll hold your place here, let's go to First John. First John chapter one. Now, when you bear record of the word of God, there are two ways that you can give a testimony. One is that God can reveal it to you, uh, having never experienced it, and you write it down. And the other is that you actually were there, an eyewitness, you saw, you touched, and um, you, uh, you knew what was going on because you were uh, an eyewitness. Verse number one, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show it unto you. That eternal life which was with the Father was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye might have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. John's gospel starts off, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the what? The Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word what? Was God. And so when he's um, talking about here in Revelation 1.2, bearing record, record of the word of God. Yes, indeed, he had a gospel to write and he had some of these other bo books, but he is also bearing witness of one who was not just the written word, he was the living word. And then, of course, uh, John adds his own writings to what is called, and this is what the book of Revelation is part of, the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Now, you remember the Bible divides the writings, its writings for Israel into four categories. One is the law of Moses, the Torah, first five books. 
Then the prophets, that includes all the prophets, major and minor. Uh, we actually, the uh, English-speaking people have done that. Uh, the Jews didn't do that uh, sp- specifically. Um, then we have the Psalms, or the literature book, the poetry books, which is Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, and so forth. And then the last category was the category called the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts, and then Hebrews through Revelation. So what John is telling us here is that this book is literally the final book of the testimony of Jesus Christ. So that's when, why he can say, verse 3, Blessed is he that reads and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things that are written therein, and note this, for the time is at hand. Just as soon as the rapture of the church occurs, the program for Israel resumes. You have a short time before the covenant signing year between Antichrist and the uh, false prophet. The false prophet is the high priest of Israel. And and the beginning of this seven-year period. Well, the seven years is not all that long. Of course, um, I would imagine it would be long if you had to be in Petra praying, give me... (laughs) This day, my daily bread, the Lord, my child needs medical attention. Lord, do something. There are snakes and spiders all around. Uh, help me. I'm sure it is. And that, that's why it's constantly talking about those that overcome, those that endure, those that have the patience of Jesus Christ, because they have to wait it out. They have to tough it out, as it were. And that is, that is a, um, difficult. But what verse 3 is telling us is that once the rapture occurs, Though the people who need information for this time, period of history, it's available in this book. The blessing comes from those who read this book. Now, we're going to get a blessing from it because we're going to see what happens to them. And we're going to appreciate, beyond a shadow of a doubt, uh, why we don't have to go through this terrible time. I'll tell you, I do. I would take the rapture any day than have to go through the tribulation period. But it's going to be a blessing because now they'll have, as it were, a daily newspaper account of what's going to happen when, pretty much, and where they are in history and how long then they have to endure and what they have to do. And it's coming from this book. So it says here, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be to you and peace from him which is, which was, and is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Now, let's just explain this a little bit by going back to the book of Isaiah 11. The book of Isaiah, chapter 11. Now, we are doing uh, our homework and our studies on uh, something that is not readily understood, even amongst grace people, though I'm sure it's better understood amongst grace people than others. And uh, this is going to be God's covenant of endowment. It's a question that Nancy Ferry's had. Uh, but we've, we have to take care of Revelation first. We'll get to this covenant later, uh, about five or ten years down the road, probably. No, that's not true. Hopefully it'll be sooner than that. But um, one, of the, one of the things with regard to this covenant of endowment is that there is such a thing as temporary endowment, which is what some Old Testament people had, and more permanent endowment. Now, for example, here's a thousand Philistine soldiers there. And uh, the Spirit of the Lord comes upon Samson, and he grabs the jawbone of an ass. Now, they're all decorated with swords, spears, shields, and armor. And what does he do with this jawbone of an ass? He kills 1,000 soldiers because the Spirit of the Lord is on him. And on and on we can go. The Spirit of the Lord came on them. But the problem was the Spirit of the Lord would go off of them. It was a temporary endowment. It didn't mean they were lost. It just meant that he was no longer functioning right there for that miracle, whatever it was. Uh, One man in the Old Testament who had the Spirit more often and longer than others was David. In In the psalm after he sinned, what did he say to the Lord? Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Well, you see, he's talking about the power of the Spirit on his life. 
to, to accomplish God's purposes. And he was uh, afraid that after this that God would no longer endue him. He was not saying he was not saved. Just he could, was not going to be endued with power until he made things right, which he did. But then the stage begins to um, change and, and shift to this more permanent covenant of, of endowment. Jesus Christ, when he came up from his baptism of John, what happened to him? The Spirit of God descended like a dove upon him, and it says he abode with him. For the Father gave not the Spirit by measure to him. Jesus Christ, until the point of the cross, had God the Holy Spirit to enable him and empower him to do the things that he did. Um, So, now we come to Isaiah chapter uh, 11, and it identifies Jesus Christ. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall go out of his roots. This, of course, was Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was uh, the grandson of, uh, of Jesse through the line of David. And David, of course, has a covenant. And as David had a more permanent ministry of endowment with the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ is going to be the prototype of the permanent endowment. And that's something that once the kingdom uh, uh, happens and comes, that's something that is going to be more permanent on people, especially those with uh, uh, resurrected, glorified bodies. Because the Spirit of God is going to rest upon these people, and they are going to live forever with His enablement on them. But now note, and here's, here's where it identifies what the seven spirits are. We just read the verse in Revelation. As Jesus Christ is associated with the seven spirits that are before the throne. Now, it's actually literally not seven spirits, but the Holy Spirit with six functions or six categories of, of abilities. Number one, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. That is the branch out of Jesse, Jesus Christ, which includes, that's, that's one, the Spirit of wisdom, two, understanding, three, Counsel, four, might, five, knowledge, six, and of the fear of the Lord, seven. So it's the Holy Spirit plus six, the six functions of the Holy Spirit on the life of Jesus Christ. And that is, that's what it's referring to, that God the Holy Spirit in his person has six enabling functions that will um, be associated with Jesus Christ and then ultimately with belie- those believers. Okay. So let's go back to Revelation 1. Verse number 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead. Now, please remember that actually the resurrection of Jesus Christ uh, until the point of the Apostle Paul was primarily for the nation of Israel. The Apostle Paul calls Jesus Christ the first fruits, but the first people that would have understood what first fruits were were the Jews. Now, what are first fruits? First fruits are those uh, uh, plants, crops that come up first. And uh, Israel was to go and, and inspect their fields and say, aha, we've got, uh, we've got uh, some uh, first fruits. So they would take them and bundle them up and bring them before the Lord. And if the Lord accepted them, then it meant that later on they would get the full uh, harvest of crops. Uh, that what he, what he accepted here would be ultimately accepted here. So Christ is called the first fruit. So a Jew, especially, here's Mary and Martha and Lazarus died. And Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. Now, he didn't say that at that time to us Gentiles in grace. He was saying it to a Jew who understood first fruits. I'm the resurrection of the life. He that lives and believes in me shall never die. He that uh, is dead, um, uh, well, how does that go again? For some reason, I never get that. He that liveth and uh, he that believeth in me, though we are dead, yet shall he live. That's, that's first fruits. I'm going to re- uh, come forth from the grave. They'll come forth from the grave. I'm the promise of the future total harvest, in other words. So um, when, it, uh, when it says here about first begotten from the dead, it uh, is significant to uh, the nation of Israel. Why also would this be 
something good to start off with at the beginning of the tribulation period to remind them that he has been brought back from the dead. Well, it's, the significance is simply this. A whole lot of them not going to make it to the end. A <laughs> whole lot of them are going to die for their faith. A uh, whole lot of them are going to be killed. And were it not for the fact that they can look back to the, t- the books of the testimony of Jesus Christ and see the verse, he is not here, he is risen. They can look back to uh, this book of Revelation and see that Jesus Christ has come forth from the grave. Then death doesn't hold that, that fear. Uh, as a pastor, I have uh, performed the funerals of those who uh, are, were predominantly unsaved, those who were carnal, and then those who were glorious believers who trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. And a lot of times those who were unsaved will fall apart. We'll never see our loved one again and so forth. Those who are carnal sometimes fall apart because, uh, well, how could God do this to me? Not understanding the plan and program of God. But for somebody who is a believer, knowing that the other person is a believer, to be absent from the bodies present with the Lord, which is far better. And I always say, we wouldn't want to, if God has called them there, we wouldn't want to bring them back. You know what I want to do? Go and join them. Uh, get us out of the cramped parking spaces that we have to fight for down here. Uh, anyway, you understand what I'm saying. He is, uh, and the prince of the kings of the earth. Now, as we're going on down here, uh, verse number six, he hath made us kings and priests to God and his father. Uh, to him be glory and dominion forever. With regard to this, it is another reminder that this is Israel's territory. We're on Jewish turf here. Now, it's not that there won't be Gentiles who will be saved. That's not true. Or Gentiles reigning. That's not true either. But the promise of a national priesthood that affects the world is given to one nation, one nation only. That's Israel. In the time of the kingdom, says the minor prophets, that there'll be ten Gentiles take hold of the skirt of the Jew and say, we've heard God is with you. Uh, we're going to go to Jerusalem. Uh, all nations are going to come to Jerusalem to worship the king and so forth. Uh, and that will be uh, during the kingdom. If you hold your place here and come back to chapter 20 in Revelation. Now this is... Another incentive verse in the, in, the, <laughs> in the beginning of the book. The reason I say that is they now can see something that they are striving for. What is that? They're striving for reward at the end of a terrible time. In, in order to, um, to get through the tribulation period, what do they have to do with their possessions, and their positions in the world. Give them up. Uh, They cannot take the mark of the beast. Therefore, they have to flee. They have no social security plan. They have no uh, bank account. Uh, They have nothing that they can fall back on. They can't even, uh, uh, once this happens, they can't even go back and sell their property. It's too late by that time. Because to sell their property, you can't buy or sell without the mark of the beast. Taking the mark, you can't get saved. So now what do I do? Well, Jesus Christ at the beginning of Revelation says, Hey, look, by the time you get to the end of the tribulation period, I'm going to reward you with possessions. That's why Peter said, he said, Lord, we've given up everything. What shall we get there for? And he said, there's no man that has given up all of these things, and he lists them, that shall not be rewarded a hundredfold in the kingdom. And so that's what he's telling them here. You're going to be a king and a prince and a priest unto God in the kingdom. Uh, may mean you have to give up and live like a pauper, but things will change. Okay, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them. And judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither received his mark on their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived. Now that is the sign of, of either one, one of two things. Either they endured through and were delivered physically, 
or they were brought forth in the resurrection, as Christ had said and promised. Uh, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Uh, note uh, verse 6. Blessed is holy uh, is he that has part of this first resurrection. This is prior to, this is before the millennial kingdom. On such the second death has no power. They shall be priests of God and of Christ and reign with them a thousand years. Okay, so we're back to Revelation chapter 1 now. Now we're coming to the point where as Christ is beginning to unveil this book, he has talked about things that are necessary prior to the tribulation period. Now he's going to remind them of something that's going to happen at the end of the tribulation period. Verse 7. Behold, he comes with clouds. Now, here's the significance. Here, just uh, about 40 days after the resurrection, he was on the Mount of Olives, and he ascended up into heaven. While he was there, uh, it says that uh, as he was ascending, the clouds received him out of their sight. And then two angels stood by and said this, Why do you stand here gazing up into heaven? I imagine that their, their mouth uh, dropped open, and perhaps by this point they needed a drooling towel because they, they were so uh, you know fixed on this uh, thing that happened. I mean, he just went right up into the clouds. And the angel said... This same Jesus shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go. And of course, Zechariah 14 tells us that as he went up from the Mount of Olives, he is going to come back uh, uh, and put his feet on the Mount of Olives. Now this happens immediately following the tribulation period, one of those 75 days. So he is beginning to remind them that with all of this hardship, it's not going to last forever. That there's a certain number of days to the midst of the week, there's a certain number of days to the end of the, of the week or the tribulation period, and there's a certain number of days that they must remain in hiding following that 75, and that he is going to return. Well, let's, let's look at it here. Let's hold our place here. Let's read the verse. Behold, he comes with clouds, every eye shall see him. They also which pierced him, all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Now, why is that? Let's go to uh, Matthew 24. Matthew 24. And verse number 29. And it says there, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun's going to be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Now that is, this is a coordinating verse here. Behold, he comes with clouds, every eye shall see him. Why is every eye going to see him? Simply because uh, God turns out all the other lights. Uh, if you've ever seen sometimes valuable gems, especially a diamond, uh, they'll put it against a black velvet. Why is that? Because it's more dazzling. That doesn't have any other competition for the light. And, it, and it's by far more dazzling. You put light on that thing and boy, it just stands out. Okay? The sun's gone, the moon's gone, the light of the stars is gone, and now all of a sudden, poof, here's the Shekinah glory uh, uh, star in the heavens. And everybody looks up and obviously they're going to see it. And they're going to know that um, either their days are numbered, <laughs> their time is very short, or that Jesus is going to return and rescue him. So verse 30 again. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now, why? Let's go back to uh, Revelation 1. Why are they going to uh, mourn? 
Why, generally speaking, will the majority of the people of the earth mourn? Uh, of course, there are two reasons. One is that most of them by this time will have taken the mark of the beast. And the others who may uh, have slipped through will be goat nations. Uh, if you are a sheep nation, obviously you are rooting for all your worth. Now, what do you, what do they say? Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. That prayer lit, is literally for the end of the tribulation period. And I can see why they would be rooting for that. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Please, Jesus, you, you better get, get the move on or we're going to be annihilated. Uh, but right in the nick of time, he will be there and he'll rescue them. So, but for the rest of them, they're taking the mark of the beast. They know their number's up. Uh, for those that are taking the mark of the beast, they're going to be thrown into the lake of fire. They're, they're part of the goat nations and departed everlasting fire, prepare for the devil and his angels. Uh, so that's why they wail. They're, they'll look at him and they will realize that Jesus Christ was who he said he was, but because the mark on their forehead or in their hand, it's too late for them. They cannot be saved. They are physically alive, but they can never be spiritually alive but from the time they take that mark. Let me show you some verses that prove that. Revelation 14. Now, let me just mention this, uh, verse 6 here. It says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Now that's part of the program that God has. Number one, he sends his ambassadors through the great commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel of the kingdom to every creature. But obviously, that's, that program is going to be greatly hindered and impeded because Antichrist is going to have his agents everywhere. So to make sure the principle is grace before judgment, to make sure that there is uh, no one that isn't given a chance, he has what we call a herald angel. And someday uh, down the road here, we will study the angelic college of heralds. There are certain angels that do certain things. There are weather angels, and there are miracle angels, and you know there are military angels. These angels are called herald angels because, like Gabriel, they declare a message to people. Uh, and so um, it, it says, He flew in the midst of heaven, had the everlasting gospel to preach to those on earth. Verse 8, another followed, uh, saying, Babylon has fallen. That's another herald angel. Verse number nine, and the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice. This is the third herald angel here in this passage. If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or hand, the same shall drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the angels, in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. They have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and take his image. Now, what did these people do here uh, primarily uh, during the tribulation period? Take the mark. Now they see Jesus Christ coming back in power and great glory with all of the armies and all of the hosts of heaven. Now, I just could put myself in their place. What would I begin doing? Wailing, because I realize that my time is up. What would I begin doing? Mourning. I, put, I was one who put Jesus Christ to death. I associated myself with this group. I chose Antichrist over Jesus Christ, and now it's true after all. He's King of kings and Lord of lords, and here I am on the wrong, wrong side of the fence. So that's why they wail. They cannot be saved, and they are now going to be vanquished as Christ's enemies. Okay, well let's, um, let's move and in, in finish up uh, this section, uh, uh, perhaps down to verse 10, very quickly. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. Now, that's, that, of course, is um, significant to the beginning and ending of time. But please remember what we're dealing with here. 
the beginning and ending of the dispensation of law. He's what this dispensation is all about, the beginning and ending, which is, which was, which is to come. So there's significance for both. Now I, John, who also am your brother, he was a Jew, he was a Jewish apostle, companion in tribulation in the, in the sense that um, he was persecuted for his faith in Jesus Christ and for his stand for the kingdom, in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, in the owl called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's why he was there. Uh, he was there to con contribute the final book in the testimony of Christ. Now, verse 10, and we'll explain this and quit. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Now, just quickly, and we'll start here the, the next time. There is a difference in Scripture between the day of the Lord and the Lord's day. Most of the time when you are when you are talking about the tribulation period and the victories that God wins through Christ, you're talking about the day of the Lord or the great and terrible day of the Lord. Well, why is the wording changed here? Because we're not talking about John being in the tribulation period or seeing something happening. Not yet. He will in a little bit. But he's telling us when the book was written. On the day of the Lord. Now, if you will tr trace that on back, there is one day, and this, is, this was a, a Roman custom, where if there was a, an important political figure, a military figure, and they, they conquered uh, enemies on a certain day, that day would be assigned to them or ascribed to them. That was their day. You know, Caesar Augustus, we uh, honor him on this day because of this is what he did. And taken from that, where we look back from 96 AD to 33 AD, and they kept tabs just like we do, we try to, of what special day that we just had. Well, we call it Resurrection Sunday morning. The world call, calls it Easter Sunday. That typically was the Lord's day. Why? Because it was on that day that he literally vanquished the greatest, strongest, biggest, baddest enemy of all, and that was death. The grave could not hold him, and he came forth on that day, and John, plus early believers, ascribed that day as the Lord's day. So if we want another name for Resurrection Sunday, we could literally say, well, it's the Lord's day. Well, you said, I, I thought that was Sunday. Well... <laughs> Uh, we might could, uh, could say that the first day of the week was when he came forth from the grave and so forth. But it's literally, he is telling us when he's writing the book of Revelation. It is on Resurrection Sunday morning, 96 AD. And now I'm not saying that, that that was the day Christ was brought forth, but it was the day celebrated because that's when he was brought forth in 33 AD. And they just every year attributed this day as the day Christ vanquished his foes. He came forth from the grave. And um, so we, we know, therefore, that it was written in the spring of the year on the day that... Uh, that they celebrated, and we too celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The name of that day, according to this book, is uh, the Lord's Day.